Hi, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and if you play Dungeons & Dragons, and especially old-school Dungeons & Dragons, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel, and now we'll move on to the video. Uh, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and with me I have uh, two folks. Guy Fullerton, say hello. Hello, everybody. And Zach Glazer. Hello, everybody. Okay, so, and what the topic of this video is, what we're going to cover is sort of the early phases of uh, publication of an adventure, um, maybe a little bit about a, a rule set, but what we're really focusing on here is um, if you want to publish an adventure, um, we're focusing um, a little bit here on um, people who are publishing using the open game license from Wizards of the Coast uh, rather than the DMs Guild, and I'll do some separate stuff on the DMs Guild because it brings in different issues. But if you're interested uh, in publishing resources for Dungeons & Dragons, um, what we're going to do here is uh, sort of talk about the beginning phases of that. Um, uh, Guy Fullerton is a, a, a name that you might not recognize, um, and especially if you haven't been uh, you know, deep into a lot of the OSR stuff, but he is one of the absolute... Uh, you know, I'm a huge fanboy because he's one of the. He's been around from the very beginning. Um, he has done um, a lot of work that other people simply haven't gone anywhere near. I mean, he's got big archives of stuff. Um, he's one of the very early publishers of OSR material using Osric, which is first edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, wonderful modules um, also so uh, the I think we've got here and then Zach of course you know uh, uh, did Whisper and Venom and uh, Death and Taxes and so also has the experience of being the small publisher we're staying away from the issue of the large publishers here um, because obviously people who are watching this are, are not aimed at being uh, huge publishers what they're aimed at doing is coming out with a first resource or um, coming out with a second resource a little bit more smoothly than they did with the first one whether it's for sale or whether it's a free resource. And so I've gone on for a very long time here at the beginning. And so, um, Guy, why don't you um, sort of start us off in terms of what we're going to address here, and then we'll get into details. Sure. Okay. So um, really this is uh, sort of the preamble to, to publishing or sharing stuff with other old school gamers. Um, a lot of people want to get into this. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it a business because there's not a lot of money in it for us, for us small fishes. Um, but, you know, they want to share. They've seen other people sharing and they're kind of inspired to share and they don't know where to start. Uh, and so I, I want to cover some of the topics on, on how you get ready to start and, and how you're going to be successful actually sharing that stuff. So I want to talk about identifying the goals and audience for your project um, figuring out your legal strategy, uh, you know, not getting ahead of yourself. There's a whole bunch of early things you need to do before you do later things. Um, about getting feedback from from other people because it's super valuable, uh, and some tools you can use uh, to to make the process go more easily. Uh, and then touch sort of very briefly on why you're going to do things like editing and revising and sculpting your sculpting your product before you throw it out there. And that's sort of the and plan. I can actually tell you what happens when you don't do those things. And I can give you actual, um, like, in the trenches answers to when he tells you about formulating a team and having a plan, why that matters. And I will say up front, a guy helped me. He did the first week through a Whisper and Venom, which I had the first thing I published, which was lucky. I got really well received. And there's people like him that helped me. But that's partially why I'm here. But I'm also, like I said, here to I can back up everything he says. With, why you don't do certain things like buy art before you actually are ready to put it in. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> All right. So laugh. let's, let's go ahead um, and, and just start. Um, I've, I've got notes here, but let's, um, let's talk first about the various um, web pages and blog entries that you've already got out there guy where um, people can go and, and, and read at more leisure some of these topics that you've been talking about. And then what we'll do is we'll put those links in the description of the video. And I may even be able to hot link uh, to something fairly soon where you see a little uh, box up here in the, in the screen where you, can, where you can hot link to it. But um, for now, Guy, why don't you give us sort of a, a topic arrangement of, of what you have, and, and then I'll get the links in there. 
Okay. Um, so the biggest resource I have on this is at the Chaotic Henchman website, just chaotichenchman.com. Uh, there's a series of production articles. And, and as I say this, I realize I don't think I have a link up at the top of the page to get directly to the production articles. So I'll try to get that made uh, here in the next day or so. Uh, and that sort of takes you step by step through um, a lot of production tasks, uh, not some of the things that we're going to talk about today, um, but uh, things like very specific fine grain editing techniques, things change, changes you might want to make to your manuscript, uh, and then sort of a step by step example of how to do layout, uh, talking about some typography details, I'm trying to remember what else I have on there. Uh, I think, I, I don't think I ever got to uh, artwork commissioning, but it's, it's something I have a bunch of notes on and I want to try to write up. Um, and I also don't have anything on there yet about deploying the open gaming license in a product, but that's something I actually plan to get written up in probably the next two or three days. So hopefully by the time this video is published, that will be there uh, and, and available for people. Okay, awesome. And so, yeah, that's uh, chaotichenchman.com. And uh, you know it's a it's a, a phenomenal resource for somebody who's just starting out, and you know you've written, uh, you know, a dungeon um, or an adventure or something like that that you just want to share with the community. It is a great place uh, to go and just take a look around um, and and get the tips. And I know hopefully here we're going to do a much higher altitude sort of approach to it. So um, it's a great name out of the various. Honestly, it is a good name. I, I actually picked the name because uh, I like working alone and I'm unreliable. So the chaotic sort of fits there. But. I, although I got I got to say, I, after working through the uh, various blog titles, putting them into uh, old school gamer radio, I think right now the winner is still the guy who titled his blog. Uh, I'll see it when I believe it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's, uh, out of the various topics that you have um, have got lined up, Guy, let's, um, I, I think out of them probably finding the team is the way to begin with because most people are sitting there um, and they've got, um, whether they're an artist or whether they're a layout person or whether they're an author, um, most people begin with one primary skill. And so let's talk about uh, finding the team if people want to do it that way. Yeah. So um, I, when I started, I knew I just wanted to publish something. Um, I knew I didn't have the skills. I decided I actually wanted to develop the skills I needed to, to do those steps. Um, but I also quickly realized that, you know, I'm not going to learn to draw. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do my own illustrations. Uh, I'm not going to be able to give myself unbiased feedback. So I knew I needed to at least uh, round up some people to help me in those areas. And a lot of people don't want to learn layout. A lot of people don't want to learn editing. And so they'll, they'll want to find uh, context that they can, they can use to, to get that. Um, I was fortunate in that when I sort of decided to start making some old school stuff, uh, I got onto uh, Rob Kuntz's Pied Piper publishing forums and bumped into somebody I already knew. Um, and he happened to be a writer. So as I started developing the manuscript, my manuscript, I threw it to him and I just said, hey, can you give me some feedback on this? You know, is this terrible? Is it okay? Am I going the right direction? Um, so that's certainly one technique you can use. Just find friends, people you know that, that are already uh, doing this kind of thing and ask them for advice. Uh, and I uh, also, I'm trying to remember how I bumped into him. Alan Gro, uh, Grodog, you may know him as Grodog on forums and stuff. He, uh, he was also a really valuable resource for me, and I, I stumbled across him. He might have also been on the Pied Piper publishing forums. Um, but this was years ago before we had resources like Google Plus and before Facebook became a really good way to contact people. I, what I see people um, have success with is to just post on Google Plus or Facebook and say, hey, I need help with this thing. Who can help me? And usually you get a bunch of volunteers. Some of them might be able to work for free. Some of them might want some money, but at least, you know, it's, it's a good way to reach out. I also know that there's some Google Plus communities having to do with small publishing. Um, I think I'm, I've joined them, but I, I, don't, I don't dip into them very much. Um, but that might be something I can do have links for. Let me let me jump in there too with this the strategy of dipping into the internet for um, for help. Do not just um, link up with the very first person 
who posts back because they're, you know, first of all, obviously, uh, the internet produces people who may or may not have the skills that they think that they do. And so, you know, talk a little bit uh, with the people that you're doing. And secondly, um, when you're doing very small publishing like this on a, you know, a virtually zero profit margin sort of thing, um, personal, um, working together well with the person and personality mesh is also very important. So that's a reason why um, your friends, even if they're perhaps not the optimal or most skilled person, sometimes as the process goes, uh, you may still be better off working, um, you know, with somebody that you already know that you're already friends with, and that will, you know, help uh, keep the motor oil, uh, you know, uh, keeping friction from happening in that relationship. So I posted on, on the ACM forums when I posted for Wishman Benham in the, the third party publisher area. And the first person to respond to me was Guy. Um, and I didn't know him. And uh, he did a great job. So although your advice is solid and sound, um, the other way did work. <laughs> I got lucky. Yeah, no, I mean, it definitely it definitely can work. I'm just saying, you know, be a no, little careful to make sure that you're not one of the people for whom it doesn't work. So so actually, that, no, that brings so bad <laughs> So that brings up uh, another interesting point. Like if you, if you want to be a publisher, you're going to need teammates. One way to find teammates is to help them out with their project. Um, I, I sometimes do drive by comments on, on people's dungeons that they post on blogs or whatever. And, and I sometimes, I feel like I may go a little too far with the critiques, but when I do it, I'm kind of probing to see, well, I really like this person's dungeon and design. Let me see if we can work together. You know, if I give them some pointed commentary that's blunt and honest, but still useful, are they going to respond in kind? So sometimes finding help isn't just asking for help. It's also giving help. And then you find the people that you kind of click with. But trust is a big thing. I mean, you really, you really want people who are going to give you honest feedback and tell you when you have something that sucks because you need to know. And then the another... Go ahead, Zach. The hardest part is that an important like personality skill you absolutely need to make a really good product is ability to take constructive criticism as it's given as opposed to being defensive. It's really hard to do. It's really nerve-wracking. But if you can't do it, you're not going to have the kind of products you want to see you created by you without being able to do that correctly. So, yeah, so when he comes, by, yeah. if he comes by your blog and leaves you... Uh, Constructive criticism, take it in the spirit is basically what I'm trying yeah, to Yeah, I mean, that is, it is a huge gift to get somebody who thinks uh, through what you're doing and, and gives honest criticism about it. And also, we raised uh, one other thing here that I want to focus on because it has to do with an overall going in attitude. And one of, one of the overall going in attitudes um, is knowing that your stuff's not going to be perfect and that advice from other people is good. The other one is that in all respects with small publishing, um, Everything is an issue of a rising tide lifts all boats. We are not competitors with each other. Um, you know, the, the people just trade information back and forth, and um, uh, that makes the whole thing better. You don't, you really don't want to go into this with the idea uh, that you have competitors. You don't have competitors, and and you and you will find that almost everybody who is successful in publishing this. They don't compete against other publishers in terms of a market or anything like that. They compete with the quality of products that other people come out with. And so you may see something, you know, like Whisper of Venom or Fane of uh, Poison Prophecies or whatever it might be. And you're like, you know what, I'm going to try and do better than that. And that's really where the competition comes in. So, it, you know, a uh, rising tide lifts all boats. Don't, don't view yourself as being a competitor with anyone. Plus, some of your best customers will be other small publishers. So if you if, don't talk trash, because honestly, they'll buy your stuff. Because I'm always interested in what small publishers are doing all the time. I buy lots of them that I only skim through, but I probably have 700 things in my li library at RPG now, and almost all of them are by one guy or three guys or whatever. So it's worth this. One guy folds into three people. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> So okay, so that's finding the team. Guy, did you want to add anything more about finding the team? Yeah, I do actually. So, uh, you know, we talked about finding people you, you can trust. I think it's also really valuable to find somebody with different tastes than you. Um, I, and I, this sort of happened with me with uh, the person I already knew when I initially started publishing and I connected with them. Um, you know, they, they tended to write the longer, more verbose third edition style modules. Um, 
and and it was interesting to get his feedback because it, it did not uh, uh, it did not mesh necessarily with what I wanted to do, but it was important to hear that feedback and sort of think through the expanse of of where I could take what I was trying to do, if that makes sense. Uh, and and I also think that people that that don't necessarily share your same sensibilities might be a little more honest with you on on where your 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 project is lacking. Another thing about that, just to add in, is that a lot of people at the outset um, may not realize the diversity of tastes that are out there, unless you're following, uh, you know, forums and blog posts and all kinds of things re religiously. You have probably got the idea that the way that you play D and D and the way that you write D and D is necessarily going to be what other people, what everyone wants to see, and that's not true. You're going to there are actually segments. Um, of people who view things in in particular ways, and they know that they like particular things, and it's useful. You you want to write what you like to read, but it's important to be aware of the fact that there are some people who are not going to jump to your product because there may be a whole other sort of segment of how people like to to read it and use stuff. And that's something you can only really get from experience, but just to be aware. Yep. Um, all right. Where should where should we jump next? Well, um, we just did finding the team, and um, maybe next let's talk about legal strategy just because it's, a, it's another very beginning sort of framework issue. Now, I've done a video about the, uh, the open game license, and once again, you know, if, I'm, if I'm able to put a little box up here uh, to link to that, um, we, can, we can do that. But let's just talk about how that fits in with the early plan. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, those OGL videos you did were fantastic. I thought I knew OGL deployment inside and out. I thought I had all the answers, um, and, and I was pretty close. But you opened my eyes to a couple things I did not know. So that was that was great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, the legal strategy. Uh, the reason I want to bring this up sort of in advance is uh, I have seen projects, very long projects, a 300 plus pages of, of work, you know, somebody's labor of love and they've even done layout and gotten illustrations and, and so forth, um, get to that end stage and they realize they need to figure out the legal situation. And then they got cold feet because they didn't know if they could deploy, A, if they needed to use the OGL, uh, B, how to deploy it if they did need it, um, and they, they just got cold feet. Now, they ended up resolving the situation, and I think they're, they're carrying on. Um, but, I mean, boy, that would be a big shame if this person spent weeks and weeks and weeks of their free time to develop this thing and then not be able to share it with anybody. So I think it's important to figure out how you're going to do it. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can go about figuring that out. Uh, I contacted an attorney. Uh, I know that's kind of expensive, but I, my initial goal was actually to make a little bit of money. So I thought I was gonna you know, be able to recoup those expenses. Um, not everybody necessarily can. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of people out there that can give you advice. You need to be careful about whose advice you get. Uh, in terms of, of the legality of the situation. Um, there are a lot of reliable people. I know, Matt, you've, you've commented in a bunch of different threads with all kinds of good OGL information. So uh, I think, you know, finding people you trust to sort of set you on the right path um, is, is a useful thing to do there. Um, I guess the, the other thing I want to point out on the, the legal strategy is uh, the OGL is not necessarily something you have to use. I think, I think a lot of people see the open gaming license there in so many products and assume that you just slap the OGL on and you're good. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, you can still violate copyright and have the OGL in your product. Um, and, and then there are certain but classes of products. Say again? But you shouldn't. Just You shouldn't violate copyright. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Want to violate copyright, certainly. Um, uh, and where was I? The, uh, you, there are certain classes of product that don't need the OGL. Um, you may still choose to use it if you are trying to share your stuff, but in terms of protecting yourself, the OGL might not be what you need. Uh, so I, I think it's important to figure that out before you start on a big project. Now, okay, so let, me, let, me, let me try and wrap up some of the things that you're saying, um, guys, so that they're you know, right after each other in the, in the thing. First of all, there are multiple... Um, 
first of all, as you understand, and especially if you're, a, you know, whether whether you're a fifth edition publisher or whether you're a, a, an old school publisher, um, the there. Uh, Whatever somebody has previously written, and that includes the rule sets, those are copyrighted, and normally you can't use something that's copyrighted except for the fact that they've come out with a license that allows you to use some of the stuff, and what you're allowed to use is the, the SRD that they've published, uh, plus any open game content that somebody else has used. That's the open game, that's the way that the open game license operates. There are other ways, uh, and, and once again, open game license, I've got a, a, a summary of it. The, there's also uh, the DMs Guild, which is an, an entirely different legal structure. Um, I don't recommend using that unless um, you desperately want to use things like uh, Githyanki or the Forgotten Realms or you know stuff that is that is not made available uh, to people who are publishing under the open game license. But the, uh, many of the economic terms of that and the intellectual property terms of the DM Guild are not favorable compared to the uh, OGL. There's also a Creative Commons license. That one does not allow you to punch into um, that open game content that is created, but if you are doing something that is very much a generic system free product, uh, that you could use the Creative Commons license or no license at all. If you are writing something that's really standalone, um, there's no need for you um, to access these little pieces of intellectual property that are in these chests that can only be unlocked with the key of a license. So that's what Guy's talking about is figure out ahead of time sort of what it is that you're going to do um, and then figure, then learn a little bit about the open game license. Learn a little bit about, um, you know, how all of this works. Talking with, you know, other people who know what's going on with that, and just sort of have that in your head when you begin. Because if you're using the open game license and you've got certain sources of content that you know you're allowed to use, then when you're writing, you know that that's one of your that that's your source, and that if you're using something other than that source, you need to at least think to yourself, do I have a right to use this? And and I think that's the idea of the legal strategy is figure out which avenue you're going. Yeah, yeah. The the other um, detail I want to point out there is just to understand your exposure should something go wrong. Um, you know, know know what the maximum penalty will be to you if you have a copyright violation. Uh, which can be a little scary if you go look at that, uh, but also look, try to do some research and see what the copyright holders have done in cases where they have been, uh, the, where there have been a violation. Um, so you can understand like what, what really is going to happen if I screw up here. Um, I've seen some people panic about being sued, uh, but the reality of the situation is you, you, if you screw up, you're probably not going to get sued. Now, I, I don't want to make that sound like legal advice, but the practical reality is most companies will send you a cease and desist letter if you screw up and then you cease and desist and you're probably not going to get sued after that. Yeah. But if you print $300, if you print $300 worth of 300, 300 copies of a hardcover book and you get a cease and desist, um, it's a sad day. It's, it's not like being sued, but it still really sucks. And so and there are consequences. And I think that to being on top of the consequences, knowing why you don't want to be there is important. I get your point if you guy play though. And we don't want to we don't want to scare we don't want to scare anybody off uh, by talking about no. that again. That's just something that you want to have, you know, in the back of your head that if you you know that you do want to get the, the legal channel of you know how you're going to be using um, you know material from rule books and so on and so forth and um, and just sort of have in the back of your head the fact that that is important um, that you stay within the guidelines yeah and so if this is the kind of thing that, that is panicking a, a would-be small publisher um, maybe they want to look at finding one of the existing small publishers to publish for them and there are a lot of small publishers and, and medium and large publishers that are happy to buy manuscripts and publish them and and that those publishers handle all the, the details the legal details that's a good point but uh, you know i'll also point out that um you know, we talk about the fact that nobody's going to make a living uh, doing rpg stuff but on the other hand um it's not all that hard to get some some beer money from it, and there are some people you know who have made a lot more you know than they than they assumed that they were going to, and you are trading that away for the most part if you're working with a publisher. So that's the balance. Yeah, yeah. Although uh, James Raji, I think uh, I've heard some some good numbers. He he does like partnerships with some of his authors, um, like profit splitting. So that's kind of a cool way to maybe make more 
and still have a publisher, you know, do the publishing for you. Yeah, that's that's true. And a lot of a lot of the publishers do have some sort of royalty system. I mean, Frog God Games. Um, generally, when we're bringing in uh, freelancers, we're we're just paying cash. But there are a few situations in which we've done a royalty. Uh, I think generally you're not going to get a royalty type of arrangement on your on your first manuscript if you're talking to a publisher. It's highly unlikely. Yeah. Okay. We talked legal strategy. Hopefully, we haven't scared anybody off with the discussion of that. It's just some, one of the things you want to make yourself aware of and know a little bit about it before you go. Um, so let's talk, Guy, uh, now about not uh, about your your topic about not getting ahead of yourself. Yeah, actually, can, can we can we go back and do identifying goals and audience? Yeah, because I, I think the, the identifying your goals kind of ties into not getting ahead of yourself. Um, so you've got this idea for a project, let's say, um, and you want to share it for whatever reason. You need to be clear to yourself of your reasons for wanting to share it. You know. Do you want to make money or not? Uh, are you trying to get feedback from people or not? Are you trying to get the product noticed? Um, you know, are you wanting it to actually be used? Uh, are you just trying, I, I shouldn't say just trying, are you trying to inspire others to create? These are, all, these are all great goals for putting product out there, but each of these goals um, requires you to focus on different things, uh, you know, especially making money. If you're gonna to try to make money, you really need to spend the time polishing and making your project stand out. Um, and so I think you need to have that knowledge in place um, before you actually start writing the project. Okay, so how do you get it? Say, say that again? Okay, so how do you get that knowledge? Well, I think it, you, it's just about being honest with yourself. You know, you, you are inspired to do something because other people are doing it. Well, I should, maybe I'll talk from my perspective. Um, 2008 was kind of a crazy weird year, year for me for a couple of reasons. And we had our second son and I started looking at my old Advanced Dungeons and Dragons stuff. And then I found out that there was newly published first edition stuff. And I happened to pick up Pod Caverns of the Sinister Shroom one day at the game store. Um, and then uh, I think a week later, I got uh, Rob Kuntz's, um, I think, Dark Chateau. And they just, they blew me away. And I realized people were putting these things out here. Um, and, and I realized people were still playing the older games. I'd been away from role playing for, I don't know, five years or something. And I read these modules, I got inspired to play, and I wanted to inspire others to play. And I thought I could make a little bit of money by putting things out there, because in 2008, there was not a lot of publishers making these. Um, and and I, I thought that plan through to the extent that I, I had goals. I, I wanted to inspire people and, and make some money. And I think really for other people, in the same boat, they just need to try to identify what is driving them. You know, uh, are they trying for fame? Are they trying for some beer money? Uh, are they trying to inspire? Um, and and maybe just write it down someplace so that so that you can focus on that uh, as you continue your later tasks. And let me jump in here and say that you know when we're talking about be honest with yourself, um, wanting to be popular with people is a valid goal. If it is driving you um, to create something cool, it's okay to have that as your as your goal. And so, you know, be honest with yourself. You know, if you're if you're like, hey, I'm you know, I'm doing this because I want people to know uh, who I am, that's cool. Don't let that, you know, tell you that, you know, what you're writing is somehow uh, you know invalid or going to be bad or anything like that. You know, just write down, you know, I you know, I want to have more people know who I am, whatever it you know, might be, but you know, as Guy said, be it is really important to be honest with yourself about those goals, or you will find yourself when you encounter things like internet trolls, um, a bad review, um, you know, whatever it might be, and everybody runs into those things. Then having your goal to look back at will tell you know will will keep you um, from just falling apart, you know, because there are points where you you know really get hit with something. Um, you know, uh, where, some, where, where someone's unhappy with you and, you know, they probably don't even have a right to do it, but, you know, they are, so. Yeah, I, I think the other interesting 
uh, reason for having the goals is I think people can get caught up in the professionalness of the, of the company that they're running. And that can eventually be a grind, you know? Um, but if you, if you realize you're just at it to inspire people, then it doesn't matter if you only come out with one product every few years or whatever, or maybe it doesn't get great reviews, but you, you know, you can't live and die by reviews because in all likelihood, even if you get a bad review, there's somebody that got inspired by your product, you know? Um, so I think having your goals in mind lets you uh, push aside the sort of distracting stuff that might otherwise get you down. I, I totally agree with that. Zach thoughts. I, actually, I do have a thought on that. I, one of the things I would recommend is um, don't have a rock set as your goal. No, I'm, um, Honestly, p people who have a, a goal like yours, you've seen. Like um, one of the reasons I was so excited when Guy answered my um, post was because I really liked both of his modules. I had I, they were um, set up in a way that I admired. They had a, a fun story that was quick, and it was, the read was nice and easy to post to my own, which I thought I would like to emulate a bit more. Um, somebody out there, like I had a. There are other people that I had look at it. Jeff Tulane didn't um, look at it, but he talked about production with me. People are there. Um, we like to talk about this stuff, honestly. Um, I can't shut up about it sometimes. So if you have an, a question about what is within your goal range, find the person who's done it or has is doing it or talks about it all the time and ask. And like I, I literally have told people, how do you do box sets? And my first answer is tongue in cheek, don't. Um, but I know how. And I people who care, I would be happy to share or et cetera. So if, rule systems, I would never ask me. but. There are people out there who you can get help from, and I just encourage you to do it because it's a great community and um, exploit it. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people that, that um, shoot me an email and they're kind of embarrassed to be asking a question because they think they're asking a dumb question. But in reality, a lot of the details you need to learn in this business are hard to find. You know, uh, People that don't know how to make a print-ready cover, um, they don't necessarily realize that the cover you upload to someplace like Lulu or RPG Now for the print-on-demand has to be the images for the front and back cover. That's not necessarily obvious to people. And, and I think, uh, you know, there, tons of people are ready to help and give you quick and easy answers and can translate the technical speak into easy to understand information. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good point that the community out there um, is a very friendly community. It is, it is not a community where people are like, oh, I'm a big publisher. I don't speak to, you know, people who are just starting out. It's not that way at all. I mean, it is, you know, like, again, this is my rising tide uh, lifts all boats. Uh, you know, people, people out there are very friendly. Let me uh, also, uh, one other point that I think we've maybe straddles a couple of these is that before you, you, um, publish something take a look at a few of the other things that are out there and and how they're organized because they're you know you can get something like you know guys uh modules are very um compact there a lot of information comes out very quickly and so you've got um, a lot of information on a single page which makes it you know uh stand up well when it's under fire at the gaming table um, there are other people who like to have long uh descriptions of what you see um, which is going to uh, work out being entirely different you know than the than the way that um, one of guys modules is used and um, I've probably written both of those two types of things um, uh, and it just you know once again that depends on the audience um, that you're doing and that'll have a lot to do with editing and sculpting which is probably we're going to do in a second video but do uh, one of the more important things probably at the very outset is take a look at some of the other things that are out there or a lot of the other things that are out there. I mean, honestly, you're not, you can get 12 different things that's kind of within your range from RPG now. And not only are you helping other publishers, you are learning stuff at the same time and spending $18. Um, it's, it's an investment you can, you won't be sorry you picked up. It really is. That's important advice. Yeah. And, and when you're, when you're looking at the other things out there, you will probably find a lot of people, um, uh, disliking some of the things that are out there, but if uh, I'm going to pick on box text for a second, I don't like box text in modules. I don't use it. I know. However, <laughs> I know I know there are a lot of people who do, um, and and I would, if you're a publisher um, who's a, a DM referee, whatever, who likes reading the box text, 
and you want to make something, you should probably put box text in it, even though there's a ton of people that are going to say box text sucks. So, you know, go look at the breadth of products out there and, and do what you like, because you're going to have passion about the, the approaches you like. You know, you want, if you want longer text, do it. It doesn't have to be short just because somebody like me says, I want it brief, you know, do what you like. Yeah, abs absolutely. And, and, and part of that too is the understanding. You must have the understanding that there is no product that will please all people. You, <laughs> you know, so don't take a person's preferences as being something universal just you know remember and this is kind of like what i was saying about there being different audiences out there you are going to have to sacrifice some portions of the audience by just because you wrote something you know and so don't you know don't try and please everybody it can't be done just take the good advice that you get about things and know what your choices are but do not take every single piece of advice that you get you can't do it yeah, I just realized an interesting thing. We, we've been saying product a lot, um, which I think makes it sound very businessy. Lately, I've been trying to say project. Um, and, and I think if, if, if publishers think of things as projects and not products, I think they may feel more free to kind of do whatever they want. You know, if you're making a product, it's like, well, I'm making something for the consumer. But if you're doing a project, you're doing something for yourself that you're going to share. Yeah, I mean that's it, that that is a real risk there because somebody you know who wants to do a a PDF with you know three interesting dungeon rooms in it and everyone's talking about products they're like well my thing's not a not a product but we are talking about stuff like that you know the, all of the do it yourself stuff you know small resources um, that are going to go out that are very short are still we're still talking about that how do you make it as as, as good as you can um, so you know this is this is definitely not focused exclusively on commercial publishing. I mean, we're talking about stuff that is, is much, much smaller. Um, and, and this stuff applies to that as well. And that's one of the things we're really trying to foster here too. Cool. So show, I, now I can actually jump into the don't get ahead of yourself section, if that sounds good. Yeah, let's see if we're, are we, are we ready for the don't get ahead of yourself one? Yeah, I, so I think so. So um, what, my, my publishing articles on the Chaotic Henchman website say, uh, I list kind of an order of tasks, and the early tasks are all just doing the writing. Um, and I find that personally very important, because if I start looking at things like layout or thinking about illustrations, um, I kind of distract from what really needs to happen before the project is done. You know, I mean, you can put a project out there that has just a, a default layout from Microsoft Word and no illustrations in it, um, and people will enjoy it. But if you never even get to the point of finishing the text, you're never going to share it, and people are never going to enjoy it. So concentrate on you know, doing the writing and revising and the editing until all that's done. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe you can flirt with the layout a little bit, but just don't get too heavily into that. Don't waste your time on that. Because part of the rev revising process is probably going to identify things you're going to ma massively need to change in layout anyway. Um, and then the other uh, sort of hard one piece of knowledge what, for me was um, if you're going to illustrate the product, don't even bother. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good point. If you're going to illustrate the project, don't even bother commissioning illustrations until you've already finished all the writing and you've already finished the layout and you know where the holes are that the images can go. I mean, that's sort of the ideal uh, in a perfect world situation. And I know not everybody can do that, especially when you've got deadlines or if you're releasing multiple versions for multiple systems. Um, but you know, if you've got the flexibility to do that, wait to do your illustrations essentially to the very end. Um, I One of us is making a scratching noise. Oh, it might be me. Yep, oh, oh. It was you. Okay, I, I'm holding my I'm holding my headphones out a little bit, so it's not rubbing on. I guess my collar or something. Okay, um, so I'm not getting not getting ahead of yourself, and I'll, I'll throw in one um, very unlikely exception to that rule is that if you are the artist, you're probably focusing on your art first. You know, if if it's your primary skill is the is the art, but for the most part, um, these things the interface 
with the uh, the person who's using your final result is is usually going to be the writing. And so, um, you know, and, and you, uh, if you're listening to this, you are probably the writer involved, and you you want to write something um, that's good. If and you're, it's a really if you're good both those things, and you're listening to this. I already hate you because that is a huge. I can't even imagine how lucky Lloyd Metcalf did some a lot of the illustrations for me in Whisper and Venom. Now he writes his own stuff and does his own illustration. He's somebody I don't like anymore because I'm jealous. <laughs> That's Jason. So, Schultz, J Jason Schultis too is is a, a switch hitter between writing and, and Jason art. Schultis on Hate List. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna get him on a, a video uh, really really shortly. So then you know you can uh, you know remember who he is because he goes to North Texas. So you'll be able to hit him next time that you see him. Yeah. I think I know who he is. I pretty. I just now I know to kill him. So <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> I hate people like that. Anyway. So art, yeah, and that and, and Guy made a very important point. And if you're not familiar with the way that layout works, um, you are going to end up with areas where um, there is like a whole bunch of page left blank because you wanted to go, you know, to another page and you want to have that um, stuff blocked in. And so that's why ordering your art after you see the layout is a really, really helpful thing to do. And also your layout guy is going to be able to tell you uh, or you're going to be able to see what the dimensions of that empty space are going to be that you have to fill. And if you just order um, some art ahead of time, artists need to know the dimensions of what it is that they're doing for you. And then you can end up with something that just totally doesn't fit in your two column format uh, or whatever it is. So that's really good advice about waiting on the art until you have you know, your first cut at the layout. Or yeah. something you cut out of the adventure completely. Yeah. So I, I say that I say that as a guy who did it. So um, that's absolutely great advice about look, not being too far ahead of yourself. So and, and sort of it's a surprising thing, but sometimes the layout actually inspires art or or uh, tells you how the art should be. Um, the best example I have in uh, Rob Coons let me republish Dark Druids for AD and D. Um, and when I did that layout, I got to a section where there are two factions of evil druids. Each one has their own spell list. So I put those spell lists on facing pages. And I realized that, hey, you know, if I, if I have the left page be faction A, and I left align all of the spell lists, and I have the other faction be on the facing page and right align all that, I have this gap in the middle. And, and it was just the right amount of space to do two like um, uh, images of the individual druids from each of the factions, like back to back and kind of an adversarial pose. So that, that worked out much better than I could have ever imagined um, just by virtue of waiting to get those illustrations done until after I knew what the space was. And that is the thing that, a, that a, a lot of people on their first product um, project um, it's it's a mistake that they make. They they end up with with some sort of um, you know stumble uh, in terms of doing that. One of mine was that um, in uh, the uh, uh, Richard Pett's Crooked City, the Blight. Um, I ordered some artwork um, for something that then. Hang on, I'm just getting some terrain out of the reach of my dog because he eats plaster. He's a dumb. Who doesn't? Ass. Yeah, no. Um, so uh, I or ordered artwork based on something um, which had some peacocks in it. And then um, Greg, who was doing the uh, the canon work, uh, took out the text about the peacocks because it was winter. And, and so I had to get back to him and say, OK, um, these are winter peacocks because I want my art with the peacocks in there. Um, and so there was some discussion about the season. And eventually, I think we ended up with winter peacocks. Very cool. Um, I, I want to throw one other uh, wrinkle out on this, not getting ahead of yourself. And I haven't thought through how to say this clearly. So, so bear with me as I kind of stumble through it. Um, it has to do with the map production. Uh, I, I think a lot of people finalize for a module, they finalize their maps perhaps too early. Um, and it, you know, it feels like a safe thing to do. You know, I'm going to do my map and then I'm going to populate the things. Um, but if you are spending a lot of time getting your room numbers just right on the map, uh, and then you realize, oh shoot, during playtesting, I really need to break one keyed area into two keyed areas, or this entire section of the dungeon is not working at all. I just need to get rid of it because if I try to fix it, it's going to take me too long and I'm never going to publish my project. 
um, you, you may find that you have to make radical changes to your map. Um, so if you're spending a lot of time doing a digital version of the map, um, wait till everything's actually settled down or use tools that allow you to make changes easily. Like I do my maps in basically an object-oriented graphics program. So when I make changes, it's pretty straightforward. Whereas a lot of the maps that I did very early on were drawn on a sheet of paper and then scanned. And so there, you know, I did, I definitely had things where it was like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, eight, seven <laughs> over on this side. Exactly. <laughs> Completely yeah. away from everything else. Yeah. Although your hand drawn maps, your hand drawn maps look fantastic, and I kind of wish I could get that look digitally. I just haven't been able to do that yet. You can't. There's just, there's no way of duplicating a that hand drawn thing. You can come real close, but I don't think you can. Really there's a reason why cartographers have their own category. You know, besides artists, editors, copy editors, authors, cartography is its own section because to do it really well requires somebody like Alyssa Faden who spends their entire life doing it, and uh, it's just pay for it is my advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's like with, you know, Dyson Logos, too, to just, you know, throw out um, a couple other the people who do cartography. It really is, uh, uh, if you if you have cash available, um, that's one of the areas where you get a lot of bang for your buck, too. Actually, at some point, and I think it's later in, in this video series, we should talk about bang for your buck if you are spending some money. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a really good subject. I can give you lots of info on that. <laughs> okay, so... Um, now, not we've done not getting ahead of yourself. Anybody have anything else to say on that? No, I don't. Zach, no, I I think we covered it mostly because uh, it's it's got it's one of those great things that has a title that says what you need to know. Don't <laughs> get ahead of yourself, and he's right. So yeah, okay. So we've done that. Now, um, the other two things that we wanted to talk about were getting feedback and goals for editing and sculpting. Guy, can we jump, I think, to the goals for editing and sculpting, or do you want to talk about how that's done first? Uh, let, let's jump into the goals is fine. Um, we kind of already covered a lot of the subjects on that. Um, I mean, one is knowing your intended audience. Um, if you're going to uh, be for profit and you want to try to sell to a group that wants a box text, then you know you need to write really good box text. Or if you're going to write for a group that um, you know really likes one-page dungeons or a certain type of monster or whatever, you need to do those things right. And, and so knowing who your audience is lets you focus on the right areas. Um, another thing to concentrate on is uh, you will, uh, I guess, you want to make sure your, your document is serving the purpose you intend it to serve. Um, you know, are you making something for at the table use or are you making something for that kind of, um, you're going to make a design support document uh, and, and the kinds of revisions you make to those things uh, and, the, and the kind of feedback you seek for those things, I think are, are kind of wildly different. Um, that's so an no, excellent point. Let me, let me really, jump in. Yeah. Let me jump in there on that point because when you are, uh, you know, writing your dungeon, um, and here I'm talking about at your, you know, with your regular play group and you're making your notes for the adventure, you're going to have a mix in those notes of things like, you know, maybe here's a random table. Um, you know, maybe here's something about, you know, uh, I'm putting this in here, you know, for Joe, or, you know, with, but you're going to have something, you know, your base document is going to be a mix, most likely, of different approaches that actually, you know, some of those things probably need to be taken out. Yeah. Um, and then, or, used, or used in something else. Absolutely, yeah. And, or, I mean, you can, even if you don't take them out, there are ways to present them in the rest of your project that's not going to, to, to bog down like your area keys, for example. You know, you may want your area keys to be real short, but there's a way you can put a table on that page to use next to it that doesn't have to be as short. And when, when we talk uh, in, a, in a later video about, um, a re about rearranging stuff, that's probably where, where that comes in most. Exactly. Zach, I, exactly. Zach, I talked over you when we were talking about this, uh, about that issue. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to pipe up and say, that's just an important point that I had never thought to actually articulate. But where it's getting used, it changes the language and the tone and the presentation later on in such a way that um, that should have gone back to what are your goals? <laughs> that, that was, that's an important point, guy. That really is, 
if I was starting from scratch, knowing what I wanted to do, I would have changed the way I did the writing based upon what went where. And just between what's an adventure text that you're going to use at a table versus what you're going to use for prep, that's huge. And so yeah. that's all. And, and even just like the language you use uh, for an adventure, the language you use in the background can be radically different and more flowery maybe than the language you use in the area keys. So mm -hmm. it, it, it varies a lot. Um, you know, there are places you want to be brief. There are places you don't need to be brief. And so let's move on now, since we've talked about the goals for doing that. Before we talk in another video about the, the methods for how to do this, let's talk about the framework for that communication uh, in between members of your team. So, Guy, you wanted to talk, um, you know, about Google Docs and the different ways of, of how to interface your team with each other. Yeah. So um, lately, I have been using Google Docs a lot for various projects, um, my own, even even things that nobody else has seen yet. Uh, and, and I do that both for team purposes and also for just uh, my own convenience. Um, it doesn't have to be Google Docs. This can be any kind of cloud-based document editor where you can get to that content from basically anywhere. Um, just limiting, just limiting the concept to a project that you're all, that you are only working on right now. One advantage is that you can make your edits anywhere. You know, if you're waiting in a long supermarket line, you can pull out your phone and open up your project and, and start making edits or start adding notes or whatever it is. Um, and, and you just be fast and loose about it. And then when you get back home and you get to your computer, um, you can start making more involved changes. Um, and, and I've got kids, I have a lot of delays here and there. There are times we're at the park and neither of my boys wants to play with me. So, uh, I can pull out my phone and, and work on a project. So I have a bunch of different projects that are in progress, Google docs. Uh, and then the benefit of that when you're working with other people is most of these cloud-based document editor editors allow, uh, comments to be added, um, or you can share it and allow other people to make changes directly. Uh, and that's, that's not the only way I operate, but uh, a group of us recently published a module called the Hyqueous Vaults, and that was a super efficient way for me and others to, to see the content and from anywhere uh, and then rapidly make changes to it. Now, another thing, too, is if uh, what that allows you to do is eliminate the problem of what's called cross, crossed drafts. And what can happen right. with the crossed drafts is when one person writes and makes changes to a document. If another person is also making changes in that same version of the document, what you can have is that you fail to get all of those changes into the next draft of the document, especially if you're doing it electronically. And so what um, normally, what you've got to do if you're not using a Google Doc that constantly updates itself based on everyone's comments is you have to make sure if you've got more than one writer or if you're a writer and an editor that you have one master draft that you're holding on to and um, that changes are made to the master draft and that person holds the master draft while they're making changes and then when it comes back to the original person, now it's that person holding the master draft and the other person doesn't make changes until they get, until they're the person who's holding the master draft. And that will save you um, a ton of um, time if you ever run into that situation of having two people working in the same draft at the same time. That becomes a nightmare of trying to trace back and get all of your stuff put into one document. It's like the Lord of the Flies that you hold the conch, right? You hold the shell. And so exactly. you can do it. And so it but it makes it inefficient. That's why his point about Google Box Docs is so important is that versioning is such a big giant problem everywhere you go that is publishing that I really do think that uh Google Docs is a solution for small publishers everywhere. A SharePoint server isn't and other kinds of methods aren't and like Matt just said, we did, embarrassingly enough, Frog God did with the Blight, the master draft method. We should never do it again. And you could learn from anybody. So if you pay attention to anything, if you're developing stuff with more than one person, it's the last three minutes. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right, guys. I, I believe we have covered the set of topics that we wanted to do in terms of people getting... Um, getting ready and sort of prepping up for uh, the work that is then done on the document. Do you guys have anything else that you want to throw into this 
uh, to this particular video on that particular set of topics? Nope. Zach? I have nothing to add except for the fact I think you picked the right guy. Then when you pick guy to come on, so yeah, no, I agree. Okay, so uh, let's 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 do this. First of all, um, uh, guy, go ahead and say goodbye to your fans that are out there. Goodbye, Zach. Say goodbye to all your enemies. That's everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> and and I will go ahead and do my sign off of no matter what type of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.